It's 3 o'clock, so let's get started. So we have assignment 6 and assignment 7, as well as your second scribe out. So are there any questions on assignment 6 or 7? So 6 is about differentiating P versus NP. And then, uh, for five of these problems, you get to choose which ones. And then uh, just a little fun problem uh, for graphs, trying to be able to color graphs and determine the hardness of a problem. Yeah. The explanation for the first part doesn't have to be, like, like, I know you want us to say, you know, it's P because it doesn't have to be, like, super long. Like, no, it, like, it, it, you should try to explain it as if someone else in the class can understand what you're saying. Yeah, I think that'd be an adequate explanation. So it's like P, isn't P because as we talked about on this day, this algorithm runs in n squared time, or something like that. Yeah, uh, and and we discuss correctness or something. Yeah. So, are there any other questions on assignment six? Okay. So assignment seven uh, is doing reduction. So we talked about a little bit about the reduction for the first question, which is transforming a KCNF formula, uh, Boolean formula, which is basically you have a bunch of clauses, and each clause contains, in this case, K or fewer literals. Uh, it may have one literal, it may have up to K. And what I want you to do is, through this reduction that you should verify first, uh, I want you to output an exactly three CNF formula. So each clause in the formula that you output will have exactly three literals in it, which is uh, done by this reduction. And, uh, and the whole idea behind the reduction is the original formula is true if and only if the three sat formula you output is also true. So true before means true now, false before means false now. Okay, so it's just doing a reduction kind of similar to the one we did yesterday and another one we'll see today. And the second qu uh, question uh, for transforming Hamiltonian path to undirected Hamiltonian path, we haven't actually talked about this reduction yet. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover that today. So you'll be able to start working on that question as well. And there's, there are some extra credit questions I think would be fun too. But it's essentially just trying to understand the uh, motivation behind a reduction, how they work, uh, being able to implement it in Python. So any questions on assignment seven? Okay, so uh, I was working on research a little bit uh, yesterday and today, and I was reading a few papers, and I came across one that had quite a few problems, so I think it would be a good idea to take a little bit of a detour from what we've been talking about and talk about writing in computer science. So trying to convey your idea in a technically correct and easy to understand way. So the paper that I'm gonna show you was accepted to IEEE and it's still published now uh, around seven years ago, okay? And all of the highlights that you'll see, uh, actually I'll just show it to you. So here's the paper. And I, I am, I'm only going to show you the first page. So what do you think the, all the highlights are? You don't have to understand what any, of, what any of the technical content is, but what do you think all of the highlights mean? Uh, that's one of them. What's another one? Uh, syntax is another. What's another one? Not necessarily something you would readily understand. That's one more. What's another one? Look in the abstract. In fact, I'll just zoom in on it. If it will hurry up. If you want to convey something, please spell goal, right? <laughs> I, I, mean that, I mean, that's pretty important. So I, I kind of wanted to show you this, that um, even experienced researchers who really did publish a piece of work can actually get a lot of things wrong. And so I only did this uh, before class for about 10 minutes. I, I only skimmed through this paper once. I didn't even 
look at every single thing. There may be more here, but these are the things that I am absolutely sure. So there is a book written by Justin, I guess, Zobel, is how you pronounce it, called Writing for Computer Science, and uh, published in Springer. And I would highly recommend looking at this book, which uh, basically tells you what is the ideal way that you should be able to present something in computer science. What's the correct, what's a really good way for conveying an idea? Like, uh, it goes over sentence structure, grammar, context, how you present mathematical equations, like the things I put in my slides and also on your assignments, how you're able to do all that. Uh, how do you present, like, what's a theorem, what's a lemma, what's a, uh, how do you organize all this? Uh, how is a paper organized into sections? What do those sections contain? All of those things. So I think that would be a good idea to look at, or maybe at least skim, for trying to understand how you would present something. So like for your project, for your final report, I want you to be able to write your ideas clearly in an effective way. So instead of saying something like, um, uh, this algorithm uh, compared to this other algorithm uh, runs, oh, what's a good way to say it? Um, Yeah, I don't know of an easy, uh, bad example, but uh, you, you can understand when uh, basically the author of the work didn't actually take their time to ex uh, write down what they meant in an effective way. So I would highly recommend looking at this for, and proofreading your work before uh, actually either presenting it in a journal or for classwork because um, even just... Uh, Cleaning up the styling of the, the work itself can, uh, of course, raise your grade, but also um, put you in a better light in terms of uh, whoever's re uh, reading your work. So I just kind of wanted to take a little detour on that. So are there any questions about that at all? Okay. So let's get back to the material then. So... We've been talking a lot about intractability. So the main core of what we've been talking about is these two classes, P and NP. And one of those literally million dollar questions is, is P different from NP? And no one knows for certainty yet. So, okay, we don't know for certainty whether they're different or not, but maybe we can try to get some intuition as to why most people believe they are different. Because if they're, they are different, then there is some problem in NP that's not in P, if they're different. And so what we wanted to reason about is what kind of problems could be candidates for this position? What uh, problems are in NP that are not in P if they are different? And so we wanted to reason about what a hard problem is. So a hard problem is one that if it were to have an efficient algorithm, then every other problem in the same class, which is NP, would have an efficient algorithm too. And so an, a formalization of that is uh, if we can reduce every single problem in NP to this supposedly hard problem, then if this problem were easy, then everything else would be easy because I can just transform it into this now easy problem. Okay? So that's what we wanted to look at. And we also looked at several problems that we can do these reductions in both directions. So, for example, clique and independent set had poly time reductions in both directions, just by complementing the graph. And so we reasoned that these two uh, problems, clique and independent set, either both had um, poly time algorithms or neither of them did. And so what we were able to look at is, uh, and formalize this notion of NP completeness. We notioned that it, the problem must be an NP, and it must be a hard problem, which we denote NP hard, which means that every problem in NP reduces to this problem. And so we looked at a problem that we didn't uh, show the proof of, but we reasoned about why uh, this is an NP complete problem, because uh, we don't have an NP complete problem to reduce from yet. This is the first one. So we wanted to figure out why we could have this be the first NP complete problem. 
because we need to reduce from every single NP problem that could possibly exist. So uh, we gave basically some heuristics of why uh, this is true. So now we have an NP complete problem. We wanted to find more. And it turns out that there are many, many more. Um, and so we reasoned that if we can reduce an NP complete problem to another problem, that problem is now NP hard, right? It's not NP complete because I didn't say that it's an NP yet. It could, if it were an NP, then it's certainly NP complete. And so we saw that clique is NP complete via the reduction that we talked about last time, which is essentially making these clause gadgets, which consist of all possibilities of the three literals in that clause. So it either could be true or false in each one. And so we were able to show that this giant graph that we're going to make has a clique of size, the number of clauses, if and only if the original formula was satisfiable. All right? So we saw that it's NP-complete. So immediately now, what other problem do we know is NP-complete? So we saw three sets NP-complete. Clique is NP-complete. But what's another one we know is NP-complete? Independent set. Why? Well, we know independent set is certainly an NP, for sure, because we can have a certificate be the set of vertices for which we want to check if it's an independent set. So we know it's an NP. We know it's NP hard because we have a reduction from clique to independent set. We also have another one the other way, but that's not necessary here. So it's certainly NP hard because clique is NP complete. So we have three NP complete problems now to work from. All right, so any questions on what we've gone to so far? All right, so now essentially what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that second problem in your homework number seven, which is basically Hamiltonian path. But before we get there, we're going to talk about some other problems that are NP-complete. There, there's a book called... Um, uh, I forget the name exactly, but it's by Gary and Johnson from 1979. And it has over 300 NP uh, complete problems. Does anyone want to guess how many are known today? Uh, not that many, but it, it's over 10,000 NP complete problems that are known today. There, there are certainly possibly many more, but the problems for which we care about, we know many thousands of them. So we, I actually should say we have three NP-complete problems to choose from, which is three set, clique, and independent set. And so one of the main problems with proving NP-completeness, once we start getting this library of problems, is which one do we choose to reduce from, right? We can choose from any one of these, and all of them will work. We, there is a reduction uh, between two NP-complete problems. They have, there has to be one. But the problem is that we want to make these reductions as simple as we can. We don't want these reductions to be difficult to construct. But we know they exist for sure. So one of the main problems is trying to find the reduction. Uh, we have more independent set and vertex cover. So vertex cover, we also were able to show uh, polytime reductions in both directions also. So vertex covers also NP-complete. So we showed NP-hardness and that they're in NP, which is all we need. Another problem, which we won't prove, but is NP-complete, is knapsack. This problem of I have a backpack, or a knapsack, and I have these items that I want to take with me. And um, what I want to do is I want to choose a subset of these items. I don't want to take maybe all of them, such that I want to maximize the value as much as I can, but subject to being able to fit everything in the backpack. There's some... Uh, positive constant for which I can't fit any more things in there. So if I have, uh, for example, a capacity 100, I can't take more than 100, of, 100 worth of items with me. Um, so the problem with that is that that problem is not a decision problem, right? Because I want to maximize a volume, uh, sorry, maximize a value of something. That's not saying yes or no to something. So you would have to formulate this in terms of a decision problem, 
because NP does not deal with decision uh, non-decision problems. Uh, but uh, certainly is NP complete. Uh, another the problem that we're going to talk about next is called Hamiltonian path, and it's essentially is is there a path uh, in this graph that visits every vertex exactly once? So, how many of you have heard of the traveling uh, traveling salesman problem? So a few of you. So essentially, what you have is this directed graph. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, directed, but most uh, instances are directed. What you want to find is, is there some way for this salesman to start in some place and go to every single city, uh, basically a vertex in the graph, such that you visit every one exactly once. Okay, so that's essentially what this one is. Uh, so that's the one we'll talk about next. And one that you'll be doing in your homework is graph coloring. So being uh, trying to figure out whether you can color a graph uh, with a certain number of colors or fewer. So that problem is also NP complete uh, for any number of colors at least three. And you'll show in your homework that uh, the lights went out again. <laughs> Those lights hate me. Um, you'll show that um, you can color a graph uh, or you can check whether a graph is colorable with two colors in poly time. And it actually turns out that if you want three colors, it's NP complete. So that little change from two to three results in a huge dichotomy between P and NP complete. There's, uh, there's no middle ground in between. And it's actually really interesting that the, P, the poly time algorithm for two color is linear time. It's not like, like n to the 10 or something. It's linear time versus exponential time for three color, which, which, which is quite amazing. So uh, you'll be showing that in your homework. But now we're going to be talking about Hamiltonian path. So before we get there, are there any questions? OK, so Hamiltonian path. So uh, path it's basically a path that visits every vertex exactly once. So there's no vertex that's left out. There's no vertex for which I hit twice. I visit every single vertex exactly once. Uh, so the problem uh, is essentially we have uh, this graph G and two vertices S and T, although I can drop those if I wanted to. So G is a directed graph. Um, we'll see why it has to be directed in a second. And it has a Hamiltonian path, so I uh, start from S and I end at T, and I visit every single vertex exactly once along the way. So I just want to determine, is there such a path that exists in G? And if there is, then I say yes. If there's no such uh, path, then I say no. So what's a, a what's a brute force way of doing this? So I have to start at S and I have to end at T. Right. It's just enumerate all possible paths of, uh, between S and T. And what I do is um, and, and I try to avoid any cycles, but um, essentially if uh, if any of them visit every vertex exactly once, which I can verify uh, since I'm enumerating them, then I say yes because I just found a Hamiltonian path. Okay, and if all of them say no, then I just say no. There isn't such a path. Okay. So any questions on the on what the problem is here? So this is actually the same problem we talked about when we talked about the motivation for finding these really hard problems, right? We know how to verify shortest paths in polynomial time, but it was kind of hard to determine the longest path in the graph, right? So this is essentially the problem, right? Uh, it's actually a, an easier version of the problem where you set all of the edge weights to one, right? Because that's just counting edges now. So the longest possible path in the graph with all edge weights being one is just a Hamiltonian path. So it's even an easier version of longest path. Uh, uh, of longest path in the graph. So uh, even this simpler version will turn out to be NP complete. But we'll see that in a second. So what we want to do is, given this graph and two vertices, we want to find if there's some way to visit all the vertices exactly once, starting with the first, which is S, and ending at T, which is the second, without any repetition. So uh, we have uh, four problems we can choose from, three set, we have clique, independent set, and vertex cover. 
So all four will work. There are reductions that uh, transform any one of them to Hamiltonian path, but we're going to actually do it from 3 set. Uh, because that's the one that's most common and uh, used in pretty much every proof of NP completeness. But uh, you could certainly do it from all the other ones. Uh, so why is ham path in NP? So remember, what is the definition of NP or a definition? Uh, non-deterministic polytime, but what's the other... Uh, well, actually, let's do it the non-deterministic way. So, what is a non-deterministic algorithm for uh, ham path, then? Well, we start at S, and I want to figure out if there's a way to get to T that visits every vertex exactly once. So, what do I do? Check every path. Every vertex. But I, I don't want to check all of them because there could be exponentially many, right? So I want to make sure that I stay in polytime, but I'm allowed non-determinism, right? So what can I do starting at S? I'm allowed non-determinism. Just non-deterministically pick another vertex. Uh, I may have many choices, but if there's a way to say yes at the end, I will choose the right thing for non-deterministic. So I just pick a vertex non-deterministically, then I start again there, pick again, keep going until I reach T, or the non-determinism uh, will stop. And then at the end, I have the sequence of vertices. So I want to check if that really is a path, right? Because it could have given me a bogus path. Another thing I want to check is, did it visit every vertex exactly once, which I can determine in polynomial time? And if all of those say yes, then I found a Hamiltonian path. So that works. What's the other definition of NP? Exactly. There's a certificate, basically a candidate solution, that I can verify in deterministic polynomial time. So what would a certificate be here? Um, all vertices are connected by a path. Um, I'm not sure if that would work because uh, it may be possible that you have two vertices that go that one goes one path and the other one goes another path. So there there may not be a Hamiltonian path, but that method would say yes because you can have. Um, let's see if I can draw here. I'm going to draw my slides now. <laughs> So like, so if I if I do my really crude drawing, uh, I have I can have a path. Oops. <sighs> Let's see if I can do this. So so I have S here. Oh, I, I know what happened. So if I scroll, then I, it goes ahead in the slides. But essentially, if you have um, if you have this vertex S and T, and you have two intermediate vertices in the middle, so uh, it doesn't matter what they call, and one path that goes above and one path that goes below from S to T, a directed path, right? So I could visit three vertices, but I can't visit four, right? Because it's directed. Uh, there's no way to go back to this vertex on the bottom. So uh, that might not necessarily work, but what would a certificate be? What would be a candidate solution that I want to check is a correct one? It's like my friend says, oh, I have a Hamiltonian path for the graph you give me. And I say, okay, what is it then? So what would he have to show me? What is a path? That all the vertices are Right, so he gives me this sequence of vertices. Right? So just a sequence of vertices, then I want to check if each one actually is a path, and we don't repeat any vertices, and we visit every one. So certainly it's an NP for uh, both definitions of NP. So we're going to do a reduction from 3 set to show that it's NP hard. Therefore, since it's an NP, 
is NP hard, is NP complete. All right. So we want to turn an instance of three set, this uh, conjunctive normal form formula, these clauses which are anded together with ors in each clause, into an instance of Hamiltonian path. And we want to make sure that if the formula at the beginning was satisfiable, then the graph at the end has a Hamiltonian path, a directed Hamiltonian path, because this is the direct version. If the original formula was not satisfiable, then the output graph does not have a directed Hamiltonian path. Okay? Any questions on what, we're tr what our goal is? I guess on account of the paper, our gal. <laughs> okay, so that's essentially what we want to do. And so when we did clique, we had these vertex gadgets, and we hooked up these gadgets in some way. And so what is commonly done with NP completeness uh, proofs, or really any completeness proofs, is these what are called gadget proofs. So you have the uh, basically vertex gadgets, uh, in this case, that you'll be forming, clause gadget, uh, no, not vertex, uh, variable gadgets for the formula. So you have a whole bunch of variable gadgets, a whole bunch of clause gadgets, and you want to hook up the variable and clause gadgets together in some way. Okay? So that's essentially how we're going to do it. Uh, suppose that the formula is uh, these clauses, C1 through Cm, so just the same way as with clique. Um, and what we're going to assume that for CI is of the form AI or BI or CI. I don't know whether they're negated or not. I'm just making this as general as possible. Um, with each being some variable or its negation. I don't know which. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a gadget for each variable in the formula. So Let's assume that the variables are x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. So I'm going to make a gadget for x1, gadget for x2, all the way through xn. One gadget separately for each. And then I'm going to try to hook them up together. And also one for each clause. So here's the vertex gadget. So essentially what we have here is uh, one vertex at the top, one vertex in the uh, on the bottom, and a whole bunch of vertices in the middle. Uh, I'll tell you how many vertices in a second, but essentially think of it as linear in the number of clauses. I'll tell you what it is in a second. So what do what the edges correspond to? Well, the top vertex will have two directed edges down to the ends of this big long chain in the middle. There's going to be two uh, directed edges from the two ends down to the bottom vertex. And in the middle, it's going to be for each uh, vertex, in, uh, two vertices in the middle adjacent to each other, it's going to be one vertex to the left, one vertex to the right. Okay? So essentially we're going to have a whole bunch of cycles in here. So how many Hamiltonian paths are in this gadget? So I want to ver start, so what vertex do I have to start with? The one on the top because there's no way to get back to it. So I have to start at the top. Which vertex do I have to choose as the last one? The bottom one because there's no way out of it, right? All right, so how many possible Hamiltonian paths are in this graph? Two. Why are there two? Because you can start from that side and go to the left hand all the way to the right. All the, right, so we can go either the it pictured this way, going down the left way, traversing all the way to the end on the right, and then going down to the bottom vertex. Or I can choose the other way. I can go down right, traverse left, and then go down to the bottom vertex. So there are two Hamiltonian paths in this gadget. How many possible assignments to a variable are there? A Boolean variable. Two. Do you think that's a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. So when you make these gadgets, what you want to do is you want to model the possibilities of what the variables could be, true or false. So you're trying to model it in this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume, I believe, going right is true. But basically, we chose that vertex to be true. 
and going left along this chain is false. Okay? Of course, I could choose either way as, as it stands right here, but that's what we're trying to think about. Going right is true. Uh, I set that variable to true, and going left means false. And that should say variable gadget, but you, you understand what this means. So variable xi is going to be made like this. So I'm going to make one of these for every single uh, variable in the formula, all n variables, if there are n variables. Okay? So I'm going to have a whole bunch of these. So now I have variable gadgets. Now I need clause gadgets. And once I have clause gadgets, I want to hook up the variable gadgets with the clause gadgets in some way. Okay? So essentially what a clause gadget is, is a single vertex. Easy. So sometimes we have clause gadgets being a lot more complicated than variable gadgets, but clause gadgets here are super simple. And so how are we going to hook these up? Like this. So we're going to, uh, it doesn't matter what order the vertices are in, but let's just, uh, sorry, the variables, but let's say variable x1, then we have variable x2, dot, 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 dot up to variable x, I guess the subscript is L. So um, what we're going to have is S being the very top vertex and T being the very bottom vertex. And so we're going to hook up these uh, variable gadgets together such that the bottom of one variable gadget is the top of the next one. Okay? So let, let's think about this. So for this top variable gadget, how many Hamiltonian paths are there just for that gadget? Two, right? Just as we reasoned. And for this one, also two. Two, 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 two all the way down. For each of those little Hamiltonian paths, how uh, are they independent of each other? So like, did the, let's just say I went left here, then went right, then went left, and the Hamiltonian path for this second uh, ver variable gadget, does it matter what I chose for the first one? No. no. So I have two choices for the first one, two choices for the second one, all the way through the end. So how, if I have uh, n variable gadgets, how many possible Hamiltonian paths, just uh, ignore the clause gadgets, of just the variable gadgets, how many uh, Hamiltonian paths are there then? Well, I have two choices for the first, two choices for the second, all the way through, two choices for the nth one. Two to the n. How many variable assignments are there for n variables? So I can assign true or false for the first, true or false for the second, independently of each one. To the end. Coincidence? I think not. Yes. So for this graph, is this a Hamiltonian? Is there a Hamiltonian path of the entire thing now? Think about it. Of the variable gadgets, yes, but I include the clause gadgets. Did I hook up the clause gadgets yet? No, there's no, there's no way to reach them at all. So there's certainly no Hamiltonian path that exists yet, right? So I want to be able to hook up these variable, uh, these clause gadgets in some way. Okay. So that's what we're going to do next. So uh, the way we're going to do it is. Uh, it's, it's actually best done by example. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to make a new item. So let's uh, see what we can do here. So let's say our formula is x1 or not x2 or x3. And uh, we'll be a good example. Not x1 or... Uh, not x3. So just keep it simple. So I'm going to call this clause uh, c1 and this clause c2. So the way we're going to do this is um, we're going to hook up the variable gadgets to the clause gadgets so that if the uh, vertex appears in, uh, sorry, if the variable appears in its unnegated form, then we're going to look at two of these vertices. 
uh, two adjacent vertices. So I'll just zoom in. So let's say that we're looking at x1 now so in clause 1. So we're going to identify two adjacent vertices in this graph. So in the, in the, in the long chain for x1. And so what we're going to do is, if we set x1 to true, then this clause is true. Right? So, if, so essentially, if we uh, choose x1 to true, then we have satisfied c1. So therefore, we want the path to go to c1 and come back. Right? And, and continue uh, to looking at all the point, uh, sorry, all the choices of x1 that could appear for all the other clauses. So what we're going to do is, if x1 appears in its unnegated form, we're going to make we're going to identify two adjacent vertices here. Choose the left one to go to c1, and from c1 come back to the next vertex. So in this example, uh, can I draw? No. Yeah. So. And right here, I'm going to have x1 uh, for these two vertices go to c1 and come back, right? Uh, if it was instead uh, not x1 here, we're going to identify two vertices as before, but do it the opposite way. So the right vertex goes to c1, and that comes back to the left one, right? Uh, because we think of going left as false, so if we set x1 to be false, then not x1 is true, and so therefore we would satisfy c1 that way. So, but here's the main problem. So, uh, let's just look at the original one. So we have x1 here and not x1 in c2. So we would identify two vertices for c1, and we need to identify two vertices for c2, going appropriate directions. The problem is that we, if we choose the same two vertices, then we may just we we might not be able to hit a particular clause gadget. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to identify two vertices and a separator vertex, and we'll see why we need this separator vertex in a second. So we're going to have two vertices corresponding to coming out to going out to a clause and coming back, and another vertex which is a separator between. Uh, be, and then after that, we're going to have another two, a separator, another two, separator. And so if we look at how many uh, vertices are in here, well, there are two vertices for every single, um, uh, possibly for uh, every single clause plus a separator. So we have three vertices uh, approximately for every uh, clause. So therefore, we have three times the number of clause uh, number of vertices in here possibly. I, I could put more if I wanted to, but uh, we certainly have a linear number. All right, so let's think about this, um, this reduction. So that's how I'm going to hook up these uh, variable gadgets to the clause gadgets. So I'm going to think of true as going to the right and, and false as going to the left. So Let's show, if we were able to show that 3 set reduces to ham path, then we're all set. We just showed this MP hard. So, we go that time. All right. so we're going to show that if the formula was satisfiable, then there's a Hamiltonian path from the top vertex S to the bottom vertex T. And so any path must start with S and end with T. So why is that true again? Because you can't get back to Yeah, so if we look back here, there's no incoming edge to S, so there's, we have to start with S. And there's nothing coming out of T, so there's, uh, yeah, so there's nothing coming out of T, so T has to be the last one. And uh, although they're not drawn here, the edges that interact with the clause gadgets are only within each of, the, um, of these long chains for each of the variable gadgets. So therefore, those edges only live in here. So the, uh, the last one that could exist would live in here. But we would have to come to T if we want a Hamiltonian path. So we must start with S and end with T, which is good. Uh, we, we needed that criterion anyway. Um, for the vertices with vertex sketches, we must move either left or right. And so here's an important distinction. Once we start going left or right, once we make a decision, we can't change our decision. So why is that? 
Right, so if we look at back at this example, if we, let's just say, start going right here, and I say, oh, I made a mistake, so I'm going to go left. So I'm going to hit a vertex that I've seen before. Right. But uh, the thing is, we could be coming out to here to, say, a clause C1 and coming back. So let's just say that X1 was true, uh, was the unnegated form in C1. So we must be, uh, the way we hooked it up to C1 is going right. So uh, let's just say we pick these two. So we come out here for C1, and then we come back to this vertex. So we can't change direction there either because we just touched the first vertex that went to C1 anyway. So we can't change direction even if we go out to a clause gadget and come back. Right? So we hook these uh, variable gadgets up to these clause gadgets in a clever way. And that way is that we want to prevent changing direction at the end. And so that was uh, done on purpose. So to hit the cl uh, clause vertex, which vertex do you think is the one that will travel to it? Well, we hook these variables up to these clauses in such a way that they, the way that it's hooked up in the clause is, if, is the way that it was originally in the clause. So the, like our example here, we had positive version of x1. So we choose uh, this vertex to go to c1 and then come back. But for like for this example, for C2, we have the negated version of X2. So we need to choose two vertices as before, but we do the other direction. So the right vertex, I go to C2, and, the, and it comes back to the vertex on the left of those two. Okay? So uh, to hit the clause vertex, uh, which vertex could possibly hit a clause? Those are the only ones that it could hit a clause are the variables that originally existed in the clause. So that was done on purpose. So are there any confusions or doubts about this? All right. So then we talked about we needed to separate these clauses, right? Because if we have, say, um, if they were the same two vertices, then I could possibly leave out another uh, clause gadget, which we don't want to do, even if the formula was satisfiable. So what we want to do is we want to have a separator vertex in the middle. So that um, uh, it, it would, this, what will this actually do? It will actually force you to keep going in the same direction. Because there will be a problem coming up shortly, but we'll see that by having this separator vertex, we avoid the problem. So uh, this is the way we hooked it up. So this clause CJ has variable XI in its positive form. So it comes out to CJ on the left vertex, and it comes back on the right vertex, uh, as before. And if it had not XI, the negated version, it comes out via the right vertex, and it comes back on the left one. All right, so that's how we hooked it up. So um, what we want to say, oh, so basically, um, we know that this graph will have a Hamiltonian path if the original formula is satisfiable. Um, but we want to look at the other direction too because maybe the formula wasn't satisfiable and we still got a Hamiltonian path. So we want to make sure that we preserve the yes answer and we preserve the no answer. So what we want to do is show instead of assuming that the formula was satisfiable, we assume that the a uh, graph has a Hamiltonian path, the one we made, and we want to, uh, if once we assume this, we want to make, uh, basically as show that the formula was satisfiable originally. So we want to, a way we can do that is construct a truth assignment. So if we make such a truth assignment and we know the formula is true, then we certainly know it's satisfiable, for sure. So we just read off the edges of the Hamiltonian path, right? So we look at which direction was taken, right? And uh, of course we make sure, of course, uh, we assume it's a Hamiltonian path, so we know we hit every vertex, but we just read off the, the directions off which way we took, right? And uh, essentially, if we look at which vertex was able to hit this clause gadget, uh, like the clique example where we uh, figured out which vertex of these clause gadgets uh, was still in the clique. 
the one that will go out to the clause gadget will be the witness for the clause. The one that says, I'm the variable that's true, uh, that makes this clause true, right? Because think about it. Once I hit a clause gadget and come back, I can't ever hit that clause gadget again, right? Like, uh, for example, if x1 hits c1 and there's a way to get from x2 to c1, only one of those can hit c1, right? Uh, both of them can't hit because then I would have seen c1 twice which I can't do because it's a Hamiltonian path I want to get, right? So the one that will hit the clause gadget is the one that says, I'm the variable that makes this clause true, okay? So that's essentially what we wanted to do. So we just read off the edges. If we go right, then we set that variable true. If we went left, we set it to be false, simple. If we uh, move right, we set it true, move left, set it false. Um, so what we want to see, there will be a problem uh, that'll come up soon, but we want to call a Hamiltonian path normal if it goes the way we expect it to. So if it starts at S and goes one of the two directions, maybe going out to a clause and then keeps going down. It doesn't make a jump somewhere else. So maybe it could be, uh, at, we'll see in a second uh, what it is, but um, it's essentially what is the intended way. So. What we want to see is if the Hamiltonian path is normal, then we have a truth assignment. So is there another way to traverse the graph while still having a Hamiltonian path? And there might be. So um, yeah, so uh, here's a possible counterexample. So we start at some maybe S or some variable gadget. We start zigzagging, then go off to a clause gadget. We can ignore that. Um, the edge that went back to A2 because we would have to go that way and we go down to say B2 and then we keep going down and then at some other point we go to maybe another clause gadget that goes to A2 and then I keep going along that way. That, that could possibly happen, right? But let's think about why this can't work. Well, let's think of that example of going to another clause gadget coming back to A2, right? So I and suppose it goes to A2, then I keep going right until I hit this uh, right end, go down, and then do my thing until I reach here. But what will happen here uh, once I reach this bottom gadget? Well, I have to choose one of the two directions, right? If I choose the right direction, I'm toast, right? Because I just went uh, through that vertex, so I have to choose left, right? But I can't go down either, right? So I can't do that, but maybe you say, well, I can keep going right and go to another clause gadget and pop off somewhere else. But that, that could happen, but uh, the way we avoid this is having that separator gadget in between. So by having that separator gadget, we want to make sure that it, the, that separator vertex, we can only hit it if we come back the same way we came. Because if we went to some other variable gadget, then I can't hit that separator gadget ever again. Uh, sorry, that separator vertex ever again. So that's the way we were able to avoid this problem. So are there any questions about that problem? Okay. So one more thing. And we have to make sure the reduction works in polytime, right? The, the reduction clearly works, but maybe it takes way too long to make this thing, right? So let's think about how big this graph could be. Well, we have one, that should say, um, that should say one variable gadget for every variable. But, um, well, we have one variable gadget for every variable and one clause gadget for every clause. So uh, we have a linear number of clause variable, uh, vertexes, right? Uh, there's one vertex for every single clause and we have a linear number of them, so that's not a problem. For every, but it could be a problem for the variable gadgets, right? We have this really long chain, but let's think about how many variables are in there. Uh, sorry, how many vertexes are in there? Well, we have this going out and coming back uh, for every single variable in every clause. So we have, um, so we have two for every instance of variable in a clause but it's three set. So we have three, at most three variables per clause. 
So uh, we have, therefore, a linear number of variables that could exist in every clause. So a linear number times two, because we have two vertices for each one of those, plus one more for each of the separator uh, vertexes, and then add two more for the top and bottom one, right? So therefore, we still have a linear number of vertices that are created. So now the only thing to check is the number of edges. Number of vertices is fine. Number of edges we need to check. Well, think about the long chain. There are only, between any consecutive pair, there's only two edges that exist between them, right? So therefore, we have a linear number per variable gadget. And for every clause gadget, we have each of, for each of those two um, ver uh, vertex, uh, for each of those two vertices that come out to a clause and come back, we have two edges there because it's going there and coming back. So therefore, we still have a linear number of edges. Right. So therefore, we have a polytime algorithm. So how many edges? A uh, number of clauses, edges per vertex gadget. Therefore, this works in polynomial time, in the size of the formula. So are there any questions about Hamiltonian path? I know that was a lot in a short amount of time. All right. So I think that's a good time to take a break. And then uh, after that, we'll talk about the, uh, how to reduce this to the undirected version of this graph. So I'll, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. All right, we are back. So are there any questions about what we've covered about Hamiltonian path. Because now we're going to talk about the related problem for, for undirected graphs. So instead of requiring that our graph be directed, now we're going to make it undirected. So uh, a simple observation may be, well, maybe we can just do the exact same reduction we did before. So could there be any problems with this? There actually could be because um, the way that we went out to a uh, clause gadget was determined by the direction of the edge. So we can only go out to the, the clause in one possible way. But for undirected, I can go either way. So I could possibly appear to a clause and then go back up this big long tree and then uh, keep traversing down. So it's not immediately clear that it actually works. And it actually turns out not to work directly. So what we're going to talk about now is how we're going to able to fix this. So you ham path instead of just ham path is the exact same problem, but I have an undirected graph. So I have undirected edges, and I start from S and bit T, and I have exactly one, uh, uh, not exactly one, but I visit every vertex exactly once, just as before. Yeah, but it's undirected. We can't use the reduction before because we can't guarantee that the path is normal. Remember that normal means that I do this zigzag thing in the way that we intend. We don't like jump up, jump down, go left and right. Um, so we can't guarantee that it's normal if it's undirected. For directed, for sure we can guarantee this, but for undirected, we can't guarantee this. Uh, can we fix this? And uh, I wouldn't introduce this problem if we can't fix it, so clearly we can fix it. But what we're going to do is we're going to try to make this undirected graph mimic the behavior of the directed graph. So I could, of course, if I wanted to show that it's MP complete, I can reduce it from 3 set, I can do it from clique, I can do it from independent set, but the one that seems easiest to me is the most related problem, right? right? Because I'm only changing directed to undirected. So if I wanted to do it from directed to undirected, I want to mimic the behavior of directions. So of course the uh, graph that I'm going to make is undirected, but I want to make it so that I'm forced to follow a direction in, the, in this new undirected graph. Okay, So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to start with the first thing that we need to uh, for any NP-complete problem. Is it an NP? Yeah, so uh, pretty much for the exact same reason as before. Uh, the certificate, for example, might be the list of vertices. 
I determined if they were all undirected, undirectly connected, and it's a Hamiltonian path at all. So it's essentially the same argument as before. Uh, a lot of arguments for showing that things are in NP is just the certificate is this, and it's pretty obvious what how you would verify whether the certificate was correct. So we're going to show that we can reduce ham path to u ham path. So uh, a lot of people get uh, confused on what the direction of this is because the notation is unfortunate. Um, so the way that it's done is the left thing you're reducing from to the thing on the right of the less than or equal sign. And of course, P means polytime. So uh, this will show us NP hard. Since we showed it's in NP, and now we're going to show it's NP hard, it'll be NP complete. So we're given as input this instance of ham path, which is this directed graph, S and T. And, I, and we want to make sure that it had a directed Hamiltonian path if and only if the thing I output has an undirected Hamiltonian path. And the way we're going to mimic that is by uh, mimicking the direction of the edges. So let's note something. So once we enter a vertex uh, in the undirected graph, we want to make sure there's only one way in and one way out of a vertex. Right? Um, of course, for uh, undirected, I can traverse any direction I want to, but I want to make a vertex gadget that has some kind of in uh, vertex and some kind of out vertex. So I must ensure that I go in the in vertex and out the out vertex. Okay? So the, if I enforce that, then I basically enforce the direction of the original directed Hamiltonian path. So that's essentially what I want to do. And we want to make sure we can't go backwards. So uh, since it's undirected, if I have some in vertex and an out vertex that goes out, I could, in principle, go the other way, which is kind of antithetical to what we want to do. We want to make sure we can only go through the in and out the out vertex. We can't go the other way, even though um, the, there's no direction on the edges, which is what we want to do. So here's naive intent, which almost works, but it's not quite work. So what you may think is, well, think about S and T. There's no way in S, and there's no way out of T, right? So there's no reason to have it in vertex for, uh, for S and no out vertex for T. But for every other vertex, I may have an in and out kind of behavior. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make two special vertices, S out and T in, and for every other vertex, V in and V out, as before. So I want to ensure that I go in V in and out V out. Uh, for every directed edge, U V, I, I, uh, in the undirected edge, uh, I make an undirected edge from U out to T in. So I'm going out of U and into T uh, through T in. So, but of course, I want to make sure that I connect the in and out of vertices together. So I want to make sure that if I go in, I, the only way that I can go from there is to the out vertex correspondingly, and then a traverse out of there as necessary. And so a problem here is that uh, this doesn't actually enforce that I go through out, uh, that I'm may possibly go through out and then through in and going the opposite way that I intended. So this, um, I'm going to leave it to, to you as an exercise, but this actually doesn't work. But the idea is very, very, very good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to extend that idea a little bit. So instead we're going to make three vertices for every, every original input vertex. Instead of this in and out thing, I'm going to make three. So we're going to make three in in, mid, and out. Uh, so what those correspond to is uh, I'm going to make sure that I go through in. It's going to be connected to mid, and mid is going to be connected to out. Okay. So I'm going to enforce that, and also S out and T in as before. Uh, I'm going to make the same edges from U out to T in as before. And instead of just from... Uh, v in to V out, I'm going to make V in to V mid and V mid to V out. And the reason we do that is that um, 
once we enter, if we want to go through out, we must go through mid, right? Because there's no way, we can't just go to in and then go somewhere else. So we have to hit mid no matter what. Uh, it actually works now. Uh, suppose that there is a directed Hamiltonian path in the input. So it starts at S and ends at T. And it has some intermediate vertices, U, V, all of the vertices of the original graph. Suppose we have that. And so this, this is what it would be in the undirected. So this is not a proof that it's correct, but this is what it would look like. So I start at S out, then I go to U in because it's from out of S to U of N. Then it, U must go through U mid and uh, because N is not connected anywhere else. Um, uh, it must go through uh, U mid, goes to U out. Then since we have U to V, we have U out to V in. Then we do the mid out, then all the way through until we hit T in. Okay, so there are any questions on the construction here? Okay, so now we've got to do our proof. Uh, doing both directions. So let's suppose we had the uh, Hamiltonian path. Well, well, if we look here, um, this actually does the forward direction because we suppose that a directed Hamiltonian path exists, then we just show an undirected Hamiltonian path. The, the one exists, right? So we certainly got the forward direction correct. So now what we want to do is we want to suppose an undirected Hamiltonian path exists, then we want to make sure that there was a directed one to start with then that would complete the proof as necessary. Suppose we had one, then we want to show that the original graph had a directed one. So any Hamiltonian path in the undirected graph must go from S out to T in, right? For, and we want to show that we must go through the out of the, uh, sorry, we must go through in of a vertex, go through mid, go through out, and then out of the out vertex. And we can't go through like this zigzag kind of pattern we saw with the uh, ham path reduction. So we want to make sure if we can do this, then we are set. So um, starting with S out, we must go through some vertex view, I don't, uh, some vertex, uh, through the end of that vertex, because that's the only way it's connected. It's not connected to, say, U mid or U out. It's only connected to U in. Uh, next vertex must be uh, U mid because there's no other way to include it in the Hamiltonian path. So let, let's make sure. So we could have, in principle, have this zigzag pattern. Like it could maybe, like, uh, let's say that vertex V was connected to U uh, via U in, so V out to U in. So maybe I could go to U in and then go to V out and then come back in some other way. Right? Uh, I could, in principle, do that. But through this mid vertex, we can't ever hit it again. Why? So we have this triplet of vertices, right? This U out, sorry, U in, U mid, U out. So uh, from, S, uh, from S out, we hit U in. So I can't hit U in ever again, right? Because I just hit it. So let's just say we do that zigzag. Well. The only way U mid is connected is from U in and U out. Those are the only thing it's connected to. So if I have to hit U mid, I must go through U out at some point in the future. Well, if I do that, then I have to go through U mid because I, ha I, I need to hit U mid, right, if I wanted a Hamiltonian path. But what can I do now? I, I'm st I, I, I have to turn around, but I just hit U out. Right? I came through you out, but I just already hit you in, and I already hit you out, so I can't ever hit you mid. So then I left out a vertex. So the only way that a Hamiltonian path could exist is if I did this triplet. If I went through you mid, uh, sorry, you in, then through mid, then through out. There's no other way that I could zigzag around, because if I did, then I would be hitting a vertex twice, and I can't do that. So that's essentially what the crux of the algorithm is about. So by including this mid, uh, then I avoid the problem I had before where I just had two vertices. I could zigzag around, come to out, and then keep going. And I still have a Hamiltonian path. But by including this mid, there's no way I could hit this mid unless I go through the triplet 
from in to mid to out. There's no other way. Okay? So that's essentially the idea here. And we must go to U out and repeat. So uh, that, that essentially proves it, right? Because um, the only thing we actually really need to prove is uh, we have uh, an undirected Hamiltonian path. We just need to read out the directed Hamiltonian path, right? But we just showed that we must go from in to out no matter what. So to make the directed Hamiltonian path, I just read out what the triplets were in turn. Right? So if I just read out say, okay, it has to start at S, but the next one's U, the next one is V, next one is W, the whatever the Hamiltonian path was originally, then I make the uh, what those vertices were in the directed version of the graph. Right? And so since we showed that you must go through the triplet, you must have a directed Hamiltonian path because I just went from the in position, uh, sorry, the in vertex to the out vertex of each one in turn, right? So therefore, I'm not missing any vertices. Therefore, I have a directed Hamiltonian path in the original graph. So this, this reduction actually does work. So now, what's the only thing? Well, we showed that there is a reduction, but now I want to make sure it doesn't take too long, right? That's the essential idea here. I want to make sure it runs in poly time. Um, well, we make this triplet for every uh, vertex in the input graph. So think of that as constant. So we have a constant number of vertices uh, for every single original vertex. So a linear number of vertices, which is good. And now we just need to think of edges. Well, uh, think about each triplet. Well, every uh, directed edge from U to V is just now an undirected edge from U out to V in, so that doesn't increase the number. But we have this uh, U in, U mid, U out, and so that makes two more edges that didn't exist before. But we have, uh, that, so that's essentially two more edges for every single original vertex. So it's a linear number of edges added on, which is fine, because I just need polynomial in the size of the graph, and it's essentially just a constant times more. So this runs in polynomial time in the size of the input graph. So now we just showed that um, this uh, undirected Hamiltonian path is NP-hard because we showed that an NP-complete problem, ham path, reduces to this problem. So therefore it's NP-hard, but we showed it's an NP before, so therefore it's NP-complete. So are there any questions on that reduction? So what you'll be doing in assignment seven is essentially doing this reduction. So you're gonna be given as input a directed graph, uh, a network X digraph, and what you'll be outputting is what this reduction did, that undirected graph that uh, results from this reduction, okay? So it's essentially doing this reduction again. Any other questions? All right, so I think that would be a good place to stop because next time we're going to be talking about problems that aren't even solvable at all. So instead of just problems that take exponential time to do, possibly, we're going to talk about problems that can't even be solved in a finite amount of time at all, which I think will be quite interesting, which will take basically intractability to the max. It possibly could be. So any questions before we quit for today? All right, I'll see you tomorrow.